Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Rohan Khandelwal, your marrow surgery faculty and in this video I'm going to talk about the potential FMG questions from the GIT portion. The first two parts that is general surgery and trauma and endocrine surgery and vascular surgery are already there on my YouTube channel and you can view those videos there. If you have any doubts you can ask me on my Instagram ID that is left handed surgeon. First, the important topics from GIT. So, investigations of esophageal disorders are very important and motility disorders, especially the images of the barium images of achalasia and nutcracker esophagus, these are frequently asked in the exam. Zenka's diverticulum, the management has been asked previously in the FMG exam as well. Esophageal perforations, both iatrogenic and spontaneous. Also, esophageal foreign bodies right so a coin in the esophagus that is being asked since the last two exams upper gi hemorrhage both variceal and non variceal you should be aware of perforation this is a short short question which is definitely asked gas under diaphragm this x-ray each and every one should be able to diagnose gas under diaphragm it is very 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 important for the exam gastric resection and reconstruction since the last two exams there have been questions post gastric resection or bariatric surgery and they've asked the complications following that. Bowel obstruction, the basic investigations and the images of duodenal atresia, double bubble sign, sigmoid volvulus, intersusception, Meckel's diverticulum, all these images are extremely important. The incisions used for appendicectomy and appendicular lump, oshner sherin regime, these were the two questions which were asked in the previous two FMG papers. Rectal and anal disorders, there's definitely one image based question from rectal and anal disorders, maybe two also in certain exams. So fistula, fissure, pylonidal sinus, anorectal abnormalities, hemorrhoids and prolapse. You should know the clinical images of all these conditions. Liver abscess, gallstones and its presentations and complications of cholecystectomy are definitely there. Each exam there are at least two questions from this topic. Also, minimally invasive surgery, varies needle is asked quite frequently. Collidocal cyst was asked in the previous exam and MRCP versus ERCP, this question is always there. Since the last two or three exams, questions regarding Whipple surgery are being asked and investigations regarding pancreatitis. So these you should be aware of. Also endocrine tumors of pancreas, there was a question last time which was asked in the exam. So this is the outline of the important topics from GIT which you should be aware of. Now let's start discussing the questions. A 45 year old female comes to the OPD with complaints of dysphagia and intermittent chest pain. Barium swallow is done and the image is shown. What is the diagnosis? Like I told you the images of achalasia and corkscrew esophagus are very important. This barium image shows corkscrew esophagus. Corkscrew esophagus we will see in diffuse esophageal spasm, patient is going to come with chest pain and this chest pain can mimic myocardial infarction. So you should know diffuse esophageal spasm can present as corkscrew esophagus. These barriums are extremely important. Achalasia cardia, you get the bird's beak appearance and in carcinoma, you get rat tail appearance. So this bird's beak appearance in achalasia which is a motility disorder is extremely important. You can see that there is gradual tapering, whereas in cancer, there is abrupt narrowing. So you should not go wrong in these two barium images. This is a short, short question. It is being asked since the last three years. It's been asked in all the exams and no one should make a mistake in this. A 45 year old male with a history of NSAID consumption comes to the emergency with severe abdominal pain. He has tachycardia and hypotension and rebound tenderness. Now we know rebound tenderness is a feature of peritonitis, right? And why is there peritonitis? Because in the x-ray, you can see gas under diaphragm. So this is an x-ray of gas under diaphragm. This nobody should make a mistake in. Every one should be able to diagnose this. When there is gas under diaphragm, we have to give IV fluids and take up the patient for an immediate leprotomy. Leprotomy means we have to open up the abdomen and explore. A baby is playing unsupervised, complains of difficulty in swallowing since the last few hours. X-ray is done and a foreign body is seen. 
So how do we differentiate whether this is in the trachea or it's in the esophagus? You can very clearly see in the lateral film, you can see this gas shadow. So we know that trachea is anterior, trachea is anterior and esophagus is posterior. And you can see that the coin is behind the trachea, right? So it's in the esophagus. Any which ways, even in the question they've said, the patient has difficulty in swallowing. So patient will have difficulty in swallowing only when there is a foreign body in the esophagus. You should know that there are three constrictions at 15, 25 and 40. These values have also been asked and the narrowest portion is at 15 centimeters from the upper incisor. This is the pharyngeoesophageal junction or C6. The other two constrictions are when the arch of aorta and when the esophagus pierces the diaphragm. The gold standard investigation for GERD is 24 hour pH monitoring. This everyone should be aware of, but there is a catch here. They are asking gold standard, so we will mask 24 hour pH monitoring. If they would have asked for gastroesophageal reflux disease, what is the investigation of choice? It is endoscopy. So the investigation of choice is endoscopy. The gold standard is 24 hour pH monitoring. This was another question which was asked in the recent FMG exam. You have to identify the pathology. They have shown an invertogram. It was written also. This is an invertogram. Invertogram is done when there is an imperforate anus. When there is an anorectal malformation, we turn the patient upside down. We keep a metallic pointer at the proposed site of the anal opening and then we take an X-ray. You can see that this is the gas shadow and this is the marker. If the distance is less than 2 centimeters, we call it as a low anorectal malformation. If the distance is more than 2 centimeters, we call it as a high anorectal malformation. Right? So this you should know, this was a new topic which was asked in the FMG exam last time. You should be aware of this. A chronic alcoholic patient with liver disease presents with melina and hematemesis. What is the most likely cause? So chronic alcoholic liver disease, it is most likely due to esophageal varices, right? Hematemesis and melina, it is due to esophageal varices. So variceal bleeding can give rise to this. Mallory V steer is also seen in alcoholic patients, but Mallory V steer is self-limiting. Right? It will start on the lower part of the esophagus and extends onto the cardia, but it is usually self-limiting. A patient who underwent this surgery few months back complains of dizziness, headache and sweating 40 minutes after consumption of food. What is the most likely diagnosis? So the patient has ha undergone some kind of gastric surgery which you can see and a gastrojejunostomy has been done. When a gastrojejunostomy has been done, these patients can present with dumping. Now the symptoms are occurring after 40 minutes. So will it be early dumping or late dumping? This is going to be late dumping. Also you can see that the features are of hypoglycemia, dizziness, headache, sweating. So which again tells us that these are features of late dumping. Now early dumping occurs due to rapid influx of fluid inside the bowel. Patient will come with epigastric fullness, nausea and vomiting and these features would start within 10 to 15 minutes of consumption of food. And early dumping, if the patient takes in more food, it will worsen. Late dumping on the other hand occurs due to rebound hypoglycemia, which is occurring because of excessive insulin release. So the features will be of hypoglycemia, like in the question stem, it will be improved by food and they will start 30 to 40 minutes after consumption of food. Now, how do we prevent dumping? That's another question which can be asked. So small frequent meals, avoid sugar rich uh, liquid, uh, avoid sugar rich liquids, avoid simple sugars and avoid liquids with meals. These are the ways how we can prevent dumping syndrome. What is the most common complication after bariatric surgery? It is iron deficiency. Vitamin B12 deficiency can also occur, calcium or vitamin D3 deficiency can also occur, but the most common is iron deficiency. These three nutritional deficiencies you should be aware of. This was also asked in the previous exam. A patient is diagnosed 
with the pathology shown in the image, which doctor should the patient be referred to? You can see that this is trichobezoar. Trichobezoar is when there is a hairball inside the stomach. And why is this hairball forming? Because the patient is eating his or her own hair. So this is a psychiatric problem of trichophagy, which is why the referral will go to a psychiatrist. This I have already told you, 25 year old female with dysphagia, barium is done. Gradual tapering, this is achalasia cardia, bird's beak appearance. Again, I am reiterating this question because this will definitely, definitely be asked. It's a free one mark which you should not lose out on. A patient comes to the ER with acute abdominal pain since one day. On examination, there is guarding present. Again, signs of peritonitis. You can see gas under diaphragm. And this gas under diaphragm suggests that there is a hollow viscous perforation. Another name for this massive gas under diaphragm is football sign, which was asked in the recent NEET exam. This is known as football sign as well, which was asked in the recent NEET exam. After binge drinking, a young alcoholic male comes with hematemesis, which stops after some time. What is the diagnosis? So I showed you a previous question where they had given that the patient has chronic liver disease and hematemesis and melina. There the answer was varices. Here the patient is alcoholic, but it is self-limiting bleeding. I told you it stops after some time. So what was the other condition I told you? Mallory V's tear. This is a Mallory V's tear, which is a tear in the lower half of the esophagus, extends onto the cardia. The vessel which bleeds is the left gastric artery, but it is self-limiting. Okay. This question was asked last year in the FMG exam. Which of the following pairs of cancer staging have been marked correctly? Bladder cancer, WHO. Bladder cancer is going to be TNM staging. Testicular cancer is going to be again TNMS where S stands for the value of the tumor marker. Oral cancer again we have the TNM staging. Gastric cancer you can have the Borman staging and the Japanese classification. These are for gastric cancers. For early gastric cancer you have the Japanese classification. For advanced gastric cancer you have the Borman classification. You don't need to know the details of both of them. This question I've already told you, this is regarding nutcracker esophagus. Again, questions regarding appendicitis are frequently asked. I told you in the important topics, what is the site of maximum pain in acute appendicitis? We know it is the McBurney's point. The surface marking of McBurney's point has been asked many, many, many times in the exam. You should not go wrong in the marking of McBurney's point. McBurney's point is the site of maximum tenderness in appendicitis and it is situated at the junction of lateral one-third and medial two-third. Again, lateral one-third, medial two-third along the line joining the anterior superior iliac spine with the umbilicus, right? So that is where maximum tenderness is there. Soas sign can be seen. This is when we do hyperextension of the hip or flexion against resistance. And obturator sign can be seen when there's flexion and internal rotation which is done that can give rise to pain. A female patient comes with, a, with right hypochondrial pain radiating to the back with vomiting. On examination, there is guarding in the right hypochondrium. She has had similar episodes in the last one year. So right hypochondrial pain, which structure is there in the right hypochondrium? Gallbladder, that is correct. So whenever there is pain in the, when there is cholecystitis, pain can be there in the right hypochondrium and guarding can be there. So the answer is going to be acute cholecystitis. Don't get confused by pain radiating to the back, right? Pain radiating to the back can happen in pancreatitis, but pancreatitis pain will be in the epigastrium. It will radiate to the back and it is relieved when the patient bends forward. Another question which has been asked many times that the investigation of choice for cholecystitis and gallstones is ultrasound and on ultrasound you see a post acoustic shadow. If there is a stone, we will see a post acoustic shadow. Whereas if there is a polyp, 
you will not see a post acoustic shadow no post acoustic shadowing will be seen here a 25 year old patient now comes with right iliac fossa pain vomiting and is managed conservatively she was stable when the pain worsened and the fever increased okay she required extra peritoneal drainage under ultrasound so what has happened here there is right iliac fossa pain we know in the right iliac fossa the appendix can be there because the patient is being managed conservatively this would have been a case of an appendicular lump when there is an appendicular lump that is when we will manage the patient conservatively right now when conservative management was being done either the patient this can resolve and we can discharge the patient or the condition can worsen like in this case and the patient can start running fever so that means an appendicular abscess was formed and that is what was drained using extra peritoneal drainage so this regime is called the oschner sherin regime where we manage appendicular lumps via the conservative means if the patient recovers we discharge the patient and we call the patient after 6 weeks for an interval appendectomy if the patient deteriorates we are dealing with an abscess and we need to drain it moving on a newborn child comes with a scaphoid abdomen and respiratory distress x-ray shown so you can see that all the bowel is inside the thorax why is the bowel inside the thorax in a newborn child the cause is congenital diaphragmatic hernia and congenital diaphragmatic hernia again a very important topic which has been asked in the exam two or three points which you should remember if you remember these two or three points you can answer questions regarding congenital diaphragmatic hernia the most common is bocdelic or left posterior lateral and you can see this is also on the left side so this is most probably a bocdelic or left posterior lateral hernia morgagni is right anteromedial you will get a scaphoid abdomen there is going to be respiratory distress and the most common cause of death in these patients is pulmonary hypoplasia the lung does not develop and that is what causes death we've already discussed this now we have a 35 year old patient who comes with sudden bout of chest pain after retching and vomiting so alcoholic patient sudden chest pain after retching and vomiting there is no hematemesis so this is not a malaria wheeze tear or varices right patient comes to the emergency there is tachycardia bp is all right auscultation there is decrease air entry on the left side and a crunching sound is heard on auscultating the heart this crunching sound is known as hammon sign and he is diagnosed with borhaf syndrome which is not a part of maclers triad so fever is not a part of maclers triad Macular triad is seen in spontaneous esophageal perforation or Boerhaave syndrome. Most common site is left posterior lateral. Common in alcoholics, patient is going to come with macular triad, which is retching, chest pain, and subcutaneous emphysema. And I told you, Hammond sign or crunching sound can be heard. This is diagnosed using a contrast study. this is barrett's esophagus this image has also been asked you know barrett's esophagus is is a dysplasia or metaplasia that is correct this is metaplasia this is metaplasia of squamous epithelium to columnar epithelium and this is also known as specialized intestinal metaplasia and if you do a biopsy of barrett's you are going to see goblet cells that is the pathognomonic thing which you will see you are going to see goblet cells this was asked in the exam kilian's dehiscence is a potential space between thyropharyngeus and cricopharyngeus and what comes out through the kilian's dehiscence that's correct zenker's diverticulum can come out through kilian's dehiscence it is a false diverticulum it starts in the midline posteriorly but final is left of the midline the earliest feature is regurgitation but the most common complication is aspiration pneumonitis 
Another very important question, a 40-year-old female comes with progressive dysphagia to both solids and liquids. Now, there is dysphagia to both solids and liquids since last month. The body mass index is also low. There are no systemic illnesses. Barium swallow is shown. So, we can see there is gradual narrowing. So, what are we suspecting? Gradual tapering, dysphagia to both solids and liquids, achalasia, right? But it's a 40-year-old patient. Weight loss also is there. The differential is going to be carcinoma esophagus. So, which two investigations would you do to rule out both the conditions or to diagnose the condition? So, we need to do and we need to carry out upper GI endoscopy that will tell us about cancer and manometry that will tell us about the motility disorder. So, for motility disorders, we do manometry and to rule out cancer, we are going to do an upper GI endoscopy. So, investigations for esophageal disorders match the following we have to do. GERD, I told you, investigation of choice is endoscopy, not 24-hour pH monitoring. Cancer is endoscopic biopsy. Hiatal hernia is CT with oral contrast. Zenker's diverticulum is barium swallow. And achalasia cardia motility disorders is manometry. So, please remember, if you remember this table, you can easily answer questions regarding the investigations regarding esophageal disorders. A constant question which is definitely asked in the exam is hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So, we have a three-week male child, three-week male child. All these are very important. Usually manifests around third week. Male children are more frequently affected, first-born male child. So, the child has been diagnosed with idiopathic hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. They've asked the metabolic abnormality. This has been asked many, many times. It is hypochloremic, hypokalemic, metabolic alkalosis. So, hypochloremic, hypokalemic, metabolic alkalosis. So, males are more commonly affected. There is reduced levels of nitric oxide synthase in these patients. You can get string sign, double track sign or mushroom sign. These are some of the signs which can be seen on a contrast study. The metabolic abnormality, I've already told you. The fluid of choice has also been asked in the exam. So, you should know it is N by 2 normal saline with dextrose and KCL. We start potassium when urine output is adequate. When do we start potassium? When urine output is adequate, then only we are going to start potassium replacement. Okay. So, just to reiterate what we've discussed in the previous question, you have a five-week male child, five-week-old male child brought to the emergency with multiple episodes of non-bilious vomiting. Why non-bilious? Because the obstruction is in the stomach and bile will come in the duodenum. So, the obstruction is before that. So, that's why it's non-bilious. So, this is mushroom sign which I just showed you. This is seen in hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. The investigation of choice for hypertrophic pyloric stenosis is ultrasound and the best time to examine the child is during feeding. A 45-year-old female had total gastrectomy 6 or 7 years back and now has anemia and neurological symptoms. What type of anemia is most common in this patient? I told you following gastrectomy, I discussed one question earlier. You can have iron deficiency. This is most common vitamin D3 deficiency and vitamin B12 deficiency. So, iron deficiency is the most common, but here they are saying that there is neurological symptoms also. So, neurological symptoms means it is going to be megaloblastic anemia, which is due to B12 deficiency, then only the patient will have neurological symptoms. Had they asked most common overall, you would have marked iron deficiency. Which of the following deficiencies is seen where terminal ileum is removed due to Crohn's? So, it's going to be B12 deficiency because absorption of B12 will occur in the terminal ileum. Patient is taking broad spectrum antibiotics for a long time and the patient now comes with diarrhea. What is the most likely organism? So, broad spectrum antibiotics, it can alter the gut flora and the patient can develop clostridium difficile pseudomembranous enterocolitis or diarrhea and we can use oral vancomycin in these patients. 
A male patient presents to the OPD with an abdominal lump in the periumbilical region, which moves at right angles to the attachment of the mesentery. What is the most likely diagnosis? So this question was asked two times two years back in both the FMG exams. So this is a patient with a mesenteric cyst and the most common type of mesenteric cyst is a chylolymphatic cyst. So mesenteric cyst can be of two types, chylolymphatic and enterogenous and you should know that chylolymphatic cysts are the most common. That's all you should know. But very importantly, what has been asked repeatedly is the tilox triad. So in mesenteric cysts, we are going to see the tilox triad. Tilox triad is a periumbilical lump which moves along perpendicular to the line of attachment of mesentery and there is a transverse band of resonance. So it moves perpendicular to the line of attachment of mesentery. There is a transverse band of resonance. This is tilox triad, the investigation of choices CECT. Dolman's procedure is done in patients with achalasia cardia. This you should know about. This was so I'm very sorry. Dolman's procedure. Very sorry. Please uh, make that correction. Dolman's procedure is done in patients with Zenker's diverticulum. And for Dolman's procedure, we use a stapler, a linear stapler. Achalasia cardia, we are going to carry out Heller's myotomy. And we do POEM in these patients. POEM is per oral endoscopic myotomy. Zenker's, we do Dolman's. GERD, Nissen's fund application. And for hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, we are going to carry out Ramsted's pyloromyotomy. I have already discussed gas under diaphragm. This we have discussed repeatedly. Another very common question is that patient is treated for gastric cancer and now develops a nodule over the umbilicus. What is the likely diagnosis? So umbilical nodule in a patient with cancer, this is known as Sister Mary Joseph's nodule. And all these atypical presentations have been asked in the exam. So Irish nodule is left axillary lymphadenopathy. Virchow's node has been asked many times. Virchow's node or left supraclavicular lymph node or Troisier sign is seen in advanced GI cancers. Troisier sign. So Troisier's is left supraclavicular lymph node. Troisier syndrome is migratory thrombophlebitis, which is seen with pancreatic cancer. Bloomer's shelf is metastasis into pouch of Douglas. Sister Mary Joseph's nodule is periumbilical metastasis. And Krugenberg's tumor is bilateral ovarian metastasis, which is seen in these patients. So this is what Sister Mary Joseph's nodule looks like, periumbilical metastasis. Krugenberg's is bilateral ovarian metastasis, which can be seen in gastric or breast cancer. These are two more signs which can be seen in patients with advanced cancers. Lesser trilat is multiple seborrheic keratosis and trite palms are hyperkeratotic palms. But most frequently in the, in the FMG exam, Sister Mary Joseph nodule, Krukenberg tumor and left supraclavicular lymph node has been asked. What is the most commonly performed bariatric surgery procedure? So the most commonly performed bariatric surgery procedure is laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, right? Is laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, you should know. Ruan Y gastric bypass is the most acceptable bariatric surgery procedure. Now no longer the most commonly performed. Most commonly is sleeve gastrectomy. And gastric banding is also a procedure. The advantage of banding is that this is a reversible bariatric surgery procedure. So banding is a reversible bariatric surgery procedure. Which of the following IV agents is not used to manage upper GI hemorrhage? So propanolol, IV propanolol is not used because if there is upper GI hemorrhage, blood pressure is already low. And in a low blood pressure, if you give IV propanolol, that can bring down the pressure further. That can be detrimental. Oral propanolol is used as prophylaxis, not IV propanolol. These are certain tubes uh, which are used to control upper GI hemorrhage temporarily. You have Sengstake and Blakemore, Minnesota and Linton's tube. In the FMG exam, details of these tubes have not been asked. You should know the pressure the hepatic venous pressure gradient 6 to 10 you will have 
preclinical sinusoidal portal hypertension more than 10 we call it clinically significant portal hypertension and more than 12 is when the varices start to rupture so these three values have been asked in the exam you should remember them bowel obstruction i told you is a very important topic many many times bowel obstruction investigations are asked elderly lady comes with non passage of feces and bilious vomiting x-ray is shown what is the diagnosis so is this small bowel or large bowel this is small bowel i will just explain to you why this is small bowel obstruction similar question was asked next year they had shown the image and they had asked which loops are dilated so these are jejunal loops which are arranged in a step ladder pattern i will just explain this to you so that it becomes easier for you to answer so whenever we get a patient with bowel obstruction now what are the clinical features of bowel obstruction you can have vomiting obstipation distension and pain okay anyone who comes with this the first investigation which we do is x-ray abdomen erect and supine we are going to do x-ray abdomen erect and supine that is what we are going to carry out in these patients so once we've done an x-ray abdomen erect and supine erect x-ray you will see air fluid levels if there are more than three air fluid levels that is suggestive of obstruction the supine film tells us about the site jejunum will have a feathery appearance you can see that there are complete volvulae these are known as complete volvulae which are extending from one wall to the other and you will get a feathery appearance that is why in this question you can see we had marked jejunum because of the feathery appearance. Similarly, you can see complete volvulae here as well. That is why we are calling it small bowel obstruction. Large bowel is seen in the periphery of the X-ray film and incomplete hostrations. You can compare them with these volvulae. Volvulae were going from one wall to the other, whereas hostrations do not traverse the entire wall. So, which of the following statements is not true regarding bowel obstruction? So, if we are going to operate a patient with bowel obstruction, please remember, I have told you initial investigation, investigation of choice. Initial management of bowel obstruction is we make the patient nil per oral, NPO. We are going to use IV fluids, IV antibiotics, painkillers, put in a nasogastric tube. Now, when we do surgery, the first structure which we need to analyze is the cecum. If the cecum is collapsed, we call it small intestinal obstruction. If the cecum is distended, we call it large bowel obstruction. So the first structure we are going to see is the cecum. This was also asked in the FMG exam. Patient comes with low-grade fever, anorexia, weight loss, barium meal, follow-through. This investigation is seen. This is classical of ileocecal tuberculosis. Many names for this, swan neck deformity, Right, you can see there is a pulled up ICJ, there is a pulled up ileocecal junction in these patients. This is seen in ileocecal tuberculosis. X-ray of the patient after abdominal surgery is shown. You can see distended bowel. So the patient is in a state of ileus. Now, patient is in a state of ileus. The most common cause of ileus is hypokalemia. Hypokalemia can give rise to prolonged ileus. Very important, very, very important. You should know for the exam. Performing an appendicectomy, surgeon encounters this lesion two feet proximal to the ileocecal junction. What is the diagnosis? This is Meckel's diverticulum. Asked almost every year in the FMG exam. Meckel's diverticulum, it is a remnant of the vitello-intestinal duct. It is a true diverticulum because all the layers are there and you get rule of two. Two percent population you see it in two inches long and it is situated two feet from the ileocecal junction. So Meckel's the most common presentation in children is bleeding and this bleeding occurs due to ectopic gastric mucosa. This was also asked in last to last year's FMG exam. We diagnose this using a technetium 99 per technate scan and it is a self-limiting condition. The most common presentation in adults is obstruction due to intersusception. That is the most common presentation in adults. 
Intersusception is when one bubble loop goes into the other and in intersusception you should know the radiological signs. You can get claw sign and you can get target sign as well. So intersusception, claw sign and target sign you can see target sign on ultrasound. This is coffee bean appearance. This is coffee bean appearance which is seen in sigmoid volvulus. This has also been asked many times. This can also give rise to obstruction and you get this coffee bean sign or bent inner tube sign. In sigmoid volvulus, you can also get bird's beak sign if you do a contrast study. A newborn comes with bilious vomiting. Remember we did hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. There it was non-bilious vomiting. Here the child is coming with bilious vomiting. So the obstruction is distal to the second part of duodenum. And you can see double bubble sign. You can see two bubbles on an x-ray. This is duodenal atresia. And we need to carry out duodenal duodenostomy in these patients. This is jejunal atresia where you will get triple bubble sign. So jejunal atresia we are going to see triple bubble sign in jejunal atresia. This question was asked last year in the FMG exam. They had asked you to identify the stoma in the right iliac fossa. So in the right iliac fossa, we can only bring out the ileum, right? Left iliac fossa, we can bring out the colon as well. But right iliac fossa, we can only bring out the ileum. So it is either a loop ileostomy or an end ileostomy. And because we can see two openings, one and two, this is a loop ileostomy. In an end ileostomy, only one opening we would have seen. So you can see here, end stoma, single opening, loop or double barrel stoma, you will see two openings. Complications of stoma, the most common complication is skin excoriation. But the most common long term complication of colostomy is parastomal herniation. So you can see here, this image is loop ileostomy. I just showed you why is it loop ileostomy. Here you can see a single opening. So this is an end colostomy. Because one more reason of ileostomy versus colostomy is that ileostomy is raised above the surface. Ileostomy is raised above the surface, whereas a colostomy is always flush with the skin. It is at the same level as the skin. 45 year old male comes with pain abdomen, vomiting and diarrhea. Serum serotonin value is raised. In the second test and discussion or second potential question video, I had told you about endocrine surgery and I told you every year they are either asking carcinoid or they are asking about pheochromocytoma. Here serotonin is raised. So this will go in favor of carcinoid tumor. Okay. So you should know about carcinoid and pheochromocytoma. Another very important question. 19 year old male came to the ER with the recurrent episodes of intersusception. On surgery, we can see a polyp. The histopathology of the polyp is shown below. You can see it has an arborizing pattern. It is like a tree. Arborizing pattern is there. Okay, like a tree. So this is a hematomatous polyp and this syndrome has been asked many times. Putz-Jagger syndrome. Many, many times this has been asked in the FMG exam. This is because of LKB1, STK11 gene on chromosome 19. Jejunum is the most common site and you will see perioral melanosis in these patients. You are going to see perioral melanosis in these patients. A 36-year-old male comes with passage of blood and mucus in the feces. Sigmoidoscopy, you can see rectal inflammation. On biopsy, crypt abscesses are seen. So crypt abscess, you should know that we are dealing with ulcerative colitis. In ulcerative colitis, rectal involvement is more common. In Crohn's disease, anal involvement is more common. Ulcerative colitis is continuous spread Whereas Crohn's disease, you will get skip lesions in Crohn's disease. Both are inflammatory bowel diseases. 
Patient is suffering from inflammatory bowel disease. Patient comes with peritonitis and perforation of the ileum. How should this patient be managed? So, because the patient has come with peritonitis and perforation and there is inflammatory bowel disease, the best would be to carry out an ileostomy and to carry out definitive surgery later. 70-year-old male comes with bleeding per rectum. There is a mass suspicious for cancer. What will you, suspect, what will you suggest? So, if we have a suspicious growth in the rectum and we want to confirm the diagnosis, what will we do? Sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy? So, in these patients, we should carry out a colonoscopy because we should see the entire colon. Sometimes there can be multiple tumors. So, it's worthwhile seeing the entire colon. Three-day-old child comes with greenish-yellow discharge from the umbilicus. What is the most likely cause? So, greenish-yellow discharge from the umbilicus. This persistent umbilical end of vitello-intestinal duct. So, what is this vitello-intestinal duct? This vitello-intestinal duct joins the small bowel with the umbilicus. This is the vitello-intestinal duct. Now, normally this vitello-intestinal duct closes. If it is persistent, if it is persistent, then there will be fecal matter through the umbilicus, right? If the intestinal end is persistent, then this we've discussed will become Meckel's diverticulum. And if the umbilical end is persistent, then the patient can come with greenish-yellow discharge. So, these are the three things which can go wrong with a vitello-intestinal duct. What if they say that the child is coming with urine from the umbilicus? Then it is because of urecus, persistent urecus. Five-year-old child is brought with chronic constipation. Patient is taking stool softeners and patient is able to pass stools. There was delayed meconium. What should be done to confirm the diagnosis? So, chronic constipation delayed passage of meconium, we should suspect Hirschsprung's disease and Hirschsprung's disease, we should do barium, enema and manometry. That is what should be done. This is congenital megacolon and in these patients, the definitive diagnosis will be made using, definitive diagnosis is made using rectal biopsy. So the next question is identify the condition based on the image. Like I said, this one question from perianal disorders is definitely asked. And you can see that there is an abscess here and there is pus discharge. So if a perianal abscess forms and then it starts discharging, that becomes a perianal fistula. So an, if you don't drain an abscess properly, it becomes a perianal fistula. I'll just show you the images of other perianal disorders which you should know about. This is rectal prolapse. This is pylonidal sinus, also known as Jeep driver's disease, where you can get multiple, ap multiple abscesses and sinuses, but they are in the natal cleft, not around the anus, but slightly above that. That is how you differentiate between a perianal fistula and pylonidal sinus. These are thrombose piles. This is a fissure with a skin tag. And only in chronic anal fissures, chronic anal fissures, will you see a skin tag. This is going to be painful, whereas usually bleeding and hemorrhoids is painless. A male patient comes with itching in the perianal region and soakage of his undergarment with purulan discharge. You have to diagnose the condition. This is a perianal. Again, I told you perianal fistulae. You can see multiple openings here. This is perianal fistulae. The classification of perianal fistulae has been asked. This was asked last year only. It is the Parks classification. You should know the Parks classification is for perianal fistulae and the most common is intersphincteric type. Intersphincteric type is the most common. Recently, questions from rectal prolapse surgery are being frequently asked and they had shown an image and they had asked which surgery is being carried out. This is Thiersch wiring where we are doing a purse string, where we are taking a purse string suture. So you should be aware of this image. Purse string suture is being taken. You don't need to know a lot of details. Just know that this is Thiersch wiring where we take a purse string suture. 
this is a perineal procedure for rectal prolapse this is known as delomes procedure and this is rectopexy rectopexy is an abdominal procedure this was asked in non fmg exam so just knowing these three procedures and the image is enough it has not been asked in the fmg exam as yet very important are gallstones invariably gallstone questions are asked like i said ultrasound is the investigation of choice and you can see a shadow here post acoustic shadow so we know we are dealing with we know we are dealing with gallstones porcelain gallbladder is when there is calcification of the wall of the gallbladder and this can increase the risk of cancer in these patients a patient has findings of gallstone abutting the cystic duct with dilatation of the common hepatic duct what is the most likely diagnosis this you need to understand this has been asked a couple of times this is mirizi syndrome this has been asked this is mirizi syndrome so in mirizi syndrome what happens is that the gallbladder becomes adherent with the common bile duct so gallbladder is adherent with the common bile duct and because it is adherent this stone pushes against the common bile duct when the stone pushes against the common bile duct the common hepatic duct becomes dilated and finally a fistula will form between the gallbladder and the common bile duct this is known as mirizi syndrome you should also know about riglers triad riglers triad is seen in gallstone ileus gallstone ileus is when a gallstone causes bowel obstruction this is secondary to a cholecystodiodenal fistula so the gallstone comes down from the gallbladder into the duodenum through a fistula and the most common site of obstruction is the terminal ileum or the last 60 cm of ileum you get riglers triad riglers triad you will get pneumobilia that means air in the biliary tree you will get small intestinal obstruction which you can see here and you are going to see a radio opaque shadow we see a radio peak shadow in right iliac fossa so these are the three things which we see in riglers triad a patient underwent a lap cholecystectomy and in the post operative period he develops fever and tachycardia counts are raised and ultrasound shows a collection in the right hypochondrium so the surgery was done gallbladder was removed from the right hypochondrium now there is a collection there means there is a leak and if there is a leak the first thing which we are going to do is we are going to put a pigtail catheter to drain the collection now this is a very important slide this slide will fetch you at least two questions in your exam so it's very important that you memorize this slide the investigation of choice for gallstones is ultrasound gallstones is ultrasound we i told you post acoustic shadowing for cbd stones it is mrcp what is mrcp mrcp is magnetic resonance cholangio pancreaticography so it is a type of an mri which is being done for biliary disorders right mrcp for cbd microliths this you don't need to remember for fmg is eus endoscopic ultrasound the gold standard to detect cbd stones and to treat them is ercp this is ercp now in the fmg exam they had also given an image of ercp and they had asked you whether this is ercp or mrcp so how do we differentiate the two in ercp you will always see this endoscope in the image you will always see the endoscope mrcp you are not seeing the endoscope ercp you will always see the endoscope and ercp is both diagnostic and therapeutic whereas mrcp is just diagnostic so small bile leakage after cholecystectomy patient is stable we'll just monitor symptomatic patients with bile leak after cholecystectomy within 3 days we re explore after 3 days we are going to put in a pigtail a patient comes with multiple gallstones undergoes an ultrasound cbd diameter is 12 mm cbd is dilated serum bilirubin is raised alp is raised what is the next step next step in this patient is going to be mrcp i told you to pick up cbd stones we will do mrcp in these patients 
विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग इज नॉट अ फीचर ऑफ न्यूमो पेरेटोनियम सो न्यूमो पेरेटोनियम वी क्रिएट वेन वी आर डूइंग लैप्रोस्कोपी एंड लैप्रोस्कोपी यू विल गेट रेज इंट्राक्रेनियल प्रेशर एंड नॉट रिड्यूस्ड इंट्राक्रेनियल प्रेशर सो वेन एवर वी डू लैप्रोस्कोपी टेन टू फोर्टीन मिलीमीटर्स ऑफ मर्क्यूरी इज द प्रेशर when pneumoperitoneum is created you should know that sinus bradycardia initially there is bradycardia that is the most common arrhythmia please remember that initially there is bradycardia due to vagal stimulation there can also be hypotension in these patients the diaphragm is pushed up so the thoracic volumes are reduced but the intracranial pressure is going to be increased in these patients very important which instrument is used for creating pneumoperitoneum this has been asked umpteen number of times this is the varies needle all of you should know how to identify the varies needle you have a stop valve here and you can see it has a beveled edge so this is the varies needle used for creating pneumoperitoneum this is again a varies needle for pneumoperitoneum this is a sharp trocar which is used during laparoscopy these are the laparoscopic instruments this is robotic surgery which is the latest thing which is being done and this is sills that is single incision laparoscopic surgery but from laparoscopic surgery the most important question is varies needle which you people should be able to identify last year's exam they had asked an alcoholic patient comes with severe abdominal pain pancreatitis is suspected and you have collection around the pancreas which enzyme is most likely to be elevated so we know initially lipase and amylase are going to be elevated so whenever we are suspecting pancreatitis we will send out lipase and amylase identify the operation shown very very important last two years this question is definitely being asked that is whipple surgery so whipple surgery is pancreatico duodenectomy and whipples is done for periampullary cancers roof top or chevron incision is done and three anastomoses are there look carefully three anastomoses gastrojejunostomy collidocojejunostomy means bile duct and jejunum and pancreatico jejunostomy three anastomoses are done in whipple's procedure the most common complication is anastomotic leak most commonly which leaks is the pancreatico jejunostomy now please again this image you should be able to identify for the exam 25 year old alcoholic male comes with pain in the epigastrium radiating to the back on examination there is a lump palpable in the epigastrium so i told you pain in the epigastrium radiating to the back pancreatitis and you see a lump as well on ct this is a pancreatic pseudocyst the most common site for pancreatic pseudocyst is the lesser sac so you should be able to identify this clinical stem and the ct this was also asked in the fmg exam you have to identify the condition you can see that the pancreas is wrapping around the duodenum this is annular pancreas annular pancreas forms when the ventral pancreatic bud fails to rotate right when ventral pancreatic bud fails to rotate annular pancreas is going to form there is going to be circular tissue around the second part of duodenum patient is going to come with projectile vomiting again double bubble sign will be seen we've already discussed congenital diaphragmatic hernia as i've told you boctalic is more common this was also asked in the fmg exam review the image and identify the condition you can see this is a para umbilical hernia right this is an incisional hernia this is epigastric hernia because it is coming out through the epigastrium how do we differentiate umbilical from para umbilical hernia umbilical hernia the umbilicus is everted right here you can see in this question the umbilicus is not everted here the umbilicus is everted okay umbilicus has come out this is para umbilical hernia where just one umbilicus is forming one of the boundaries of the hernia right so you look at this this image and this image are similar 
that is why it is paraumbilical hernia and not umbilical hernia and paraumbilical hernia small opening so it can undergo strangulation a newborn is found to have herniation of bowel and liver through the umbilicus which is covered with a membrane so what is the diagnosis so there are two conditions in a newborn omphalocele and gastroschisis omphalocele is through the umbilicus covered by a membrane and liver can also herniate so you can see the child is born all this defect has come out through the umbilicus liver also you can see but it is covered by a membrane so the answer here is going to be omphalocele gastroschisis not covered by a membrane it is adjacent to the umbilicus that is gastroschisis so these are the abdominal wall defects which you should be aware of so these were some of the questions which i wanted you to know about this was part 3 of the potential questions the other parts are already there on my youtube channel if you have any doubts you can ask me on left handed surgeon part 4 that is urology and miscellaneous topics it will be uploaded by monday i am going to upload it i'll try to upload it by saturday or sunday if not by monday i'll upload part 4 as well please like and share this with your friends and all the best for your fmg exam